Hi, my name is Stephen Schmidt from the Greenwich Library. My guest today is Robert Kolker, author of the best-selling book, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family. The book came out in early April on Doubleday Books and has received both critical and commercial success. Robert, thanks so much for being here today and congratulations on the book. Thank you, it's great to be talking to you. Um, so to start us off, please give us a brief synopsis of the book. This is a nonfiction book. It's both a, an enormous family saga, multi-generational, where you meet the parents and then you meet the second generation. And it's also a, a medical mystery about schizophrenia. This is a family where the parents had 12 children during the baby boom between 1945 and 1965. And then in the late 60s and 70s, six of those 12 children uh, became acutely mentally ill, each of them with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. The family ended up getting studied by the National Institute of Mental Health and by other researchers who were hoping to unlock the key to schizophrenia, which remains mysterious to this day. Nevertheless, this family is really responsible for a lot of very interesting advances in our understanding of the illness. And so the book weaves in information about the science of schizophrenia all in the service of the family story, which is both intimate and emotional because, and this is really the, the part that was a challenge for me, the challenge of a career, I was able to speak with every living member of the Galvin family and was then, for you know, it fell on me to try to tell the story faithfully, omnisciently, with the, all 14 Galvin family members' points of view, the 12 children and the two parents. And hopefully it comes off as a, almost a novelistic look at this family, although of course everything in the book is nonfiction. Uh, there is so much to unpack here with this book, and I'm not really sure where to start, but um, let me just ask, how did you first become aware of the Galvin family? Uh, a little over four years ago, a good friend of mine who also was my editor for a long time at New York Magazine, which is really where my career took shape, he connected me with the two youngest members of the Galvin family. They're the only girls among the 12 children, uh, Lindsay and Margaret. They both were in their 50s and they had been talking for decades about ways to tell their family story. Because while the Galvins were important to some researchers studying schizophrenia, their participation was always anonymous. And even the family didn't know uh, everything that happened with these researchers' careers and their advances since participating. The sisters had also been through a lot. I mean, all of the terrible things that happened at home uh, as a result of having so much mental illness around really trickled down to them. So while they weren't mentally ill themselves, they experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of abuse. When I, when I talked to them, I couldn't believe that so many horrible things had happened with just one family. And um, I was also mystified as to how the family could even stay together under such circumstances. And I was skeptical that I'd be able to get everyone's participation. And I decided eventually not to work on this book unless every living family member was interested in being interviewed. Um, that took a long time. It took more than a year. And then uh, I really worked full time in earnest since the of 2017 to get, uh, uh, to get the book in shape. Um, and now you just you touched upon this a little bit, but um... In writing the book, how were you able to get such specific information on what happened throughout the lives of the Galvin family? And, and so you, you, you spoke to them personally, and how forthcoming were they? And did you speak to the surviving members of the family who are ill? I did. I'll, I'll take the last question first. I definitely okay. spoke to the ill family members. And one of the big challenges I knew from the start would be to write about mental illness in a humanistic and nuanced way. I didn't want to write a monster movie. I, I wanted to, to write a book where the mentally ill siblings were every bit as much humanized or made realistic as the non-mentally ill ones. And I, in the beginning, I wondered how that would happen. I didn't want to just say, and then Joe lost his mind. And then that's the last you hear about Joe. I, I, what, what I was what I learned very early on is that everybody's symptoms manifested differently. And of course, everybody has different personalities to begin with. And so it was much more clear to me once I met the surviving mentally ill siblings that, that it really was not going to be difficult to, um, to write about them as people. And, and I, that was 
that was a, a great pleasure actually to be able to get to know them a little bit as well. Um, the, the, uh, the science of mental illness was all new to me too and I needed to learn about that as well. So I just gotta say, um, having 12 kids seems to me a recipe for disaster. Um, why did Don and Mimi, who are the parents of the Galvin family, want such a large family? And do you think the number of kids played into what transpired regarding the illnesses in the family? Well, certainly it's hard to individuate oneself in a large family. And, um, and, and in a very large family like this one, it would be doubly hard. And then it would be four times as hard if suddenly everybody's concentrating on mental illness, which seems to be spreading like a forest fire and nobody really knows why. Remember, this is a time when it wasn't a, a decided question about how, whether mental illness was inherited or whether it was created somehow. They were looking at the drinking water, they were being accused of being bad parents. It, it, was, it was a mess. So to grow up at, like that in a large family to begin with uh, meant that you got overlooked if you were mentally well. It meant that you felt forsaken or even abandoned and had very critical feelings toward your parents feelings that you revisited later in life. And so the scope of the book sort of gets the, the children's experiences when they're young versus when they're older, which I think is, is helpful and, and makes for a, a rich narrative. But to get back to the large family part, there were other large families on their block in the 50s on their street, um, but not a lot. And certainly within their own families, they were seen as strange, the, the, the in-laws and outlaws and cousins, they all asked, why, why are they having so many children? It, this is weird. Even though they're a Catholic family, that 12 seems excessive. And um, particularly the last few, Mimi insisted on having more children, perhaps because she wanted girls or, or some other reason, but she, she was facing real medical risks in having children after so many, but she kept on doing it. So she really, this wasn't just something they fell into. I, I, I've arrived at some thoughts on that, on why they did it. And um, I think some of it has to do with wanting to lead lives of di distinction. They, were, they had, uh, you know, Don, the father, had career struggles, and Mimi gave up, a, a, you know, it was a brilliant woman who gave up a college education and moved to a small town out in Colorado to, because of her husband's career. And this was a chance for them to, uh, to have a little bit of glory. But I think even that doesn't explain everything. I think Mimi in particular had abandonment issues, had a father who disappeared from her life when she was younger, had a husband who kind of disappeared from her life immediately because he was working all the time and, uh, and, and then developed hobbies that kept him out of the house too. You know, she was creating a, a whole new family for herself in a way. You know, regarding the, you know, the last two kids and the dangers, I thought it, it was, well, of, of having so many kids, I thought it was interesting that um, her doctor, Mimi's doctor, even said, if you have any more kids, I'm not going to treat you. Right. Yeah. And um, that was probably after a couple of pregnancies when he was on the fence about it. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm going to uh, carry on with something you just mentioned earlier. And near the beginning of the book, you talk about something I found poignant. In a family of 12 kids, in which six suffer from mental illness, the other six who aren't ill are affected by the situation in an entirely different way. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about that. The two youngest were the girls, Margaret and Lindsay, and then there were some other boys as well who were very young watching it all happen and living with it. Those who did not become mentally ill spent their, li their early lives, first of all, the, the strangeness in the house was somewhat normalized. They, part of them thought, well, this must be what the world is like, having weird things happen. But then there was pressure. There was pressure to be perfect all the time because if you were the slightest bit imperfect, then not only were you causing trouble for parents who already were in over their head, you also were perhaps sending a signal that not everything was all right with you mentally as well. You didn't want to be suspected of being mentally ill. And then in all sincerity, you would go to bed every night wondering if you would wake up mentally ill because it was happening to other siblings in your family and nobody knew why. So the, those two things, the fear of becoming sick yourself and the fear of being pigeonholed as sick unfairly by your parents meant that they were on eggshells all of the time. 
And then there was abuse. They, it, the girls tried to get out of the house by staying at their much older brother Jim's house, but Jim abused them. And, and that the parents had no idea and had no uh, bandwidth to even begin to wonder if everything was all right at Jim's house because they were so focused on everything else. That made the girls angry. They grew up in their teen years both furious with their parents for forsaking them this way and letting harm come to them. And they didn't know what to do with those feelings. This is the part in, the, in telling the story where I say, I wondered throughout the reporting of this book, why didn't these girls in particular and other members of this family just blow out of town as soon as they could and never come back? Why didn't they go to Los Angeles and go to law school and change their name, send a Christmas card every now and then, but, but essentially say, I'm out of here. And to me, the, um, what, what makes this family story such a great family story is that you see how they each process their traumas over not just years, but decades. And you see how each of them come to find a way to, to rebuild their lives on their own terms and re-engage with their family on their own terms. And that, that to me was stunning to, uh, to learn about. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're really the only two non-ill kids who even bothered to try to re-engage. And, and Margaret did, was really reticent about re-engaging. That's right. You see many different ways of processing the same traumas. And that to me was interesting too. When I first started reporting this, I thought, well, it will be a story of the sisters who banded together to survive this terrible set of circumstances. But then I very quickly learned that they each had very different coping mechanisms and actually clashed with one another sometimes. And I worried about that for a second or two. And then I thought to myself, actually, this is real. This is, this is uh, what every family experiences. Uh, I have a brother and I have a sister. And if you sat us down to talk about family stories, I'm sure each of us would have our own self-serving spin on, on what happened and when it happened. And, and, and this is the way it works. And so readers get two women growing up with basically more or less the same traumas, dealing with them in drastically different ways. And I think that's that's helpful as readers to see how that works. And then of course the Well brothers all find a way through as well in different ways. We, there are whole chapters where uh, Michael, one brother goes to live on a commune and it, it, you see lots of different coping mechanisms. You know, I would, Michael is an interesting character because he was one of those, you know, Well kids that sort of, he got institutionalized anyways. And he was somewhat, I think, you know, and you mentioned it too, saved by his experience at the commune. And it was his grandmother who took him there, correct? <laughs> That's right. So, the, the, you know, this story takes place in the 60s and 70s. And by the 70s, when, when the parents suspected that something was off about Michael, he, he insisted that there was nothing wrong with him, that maybe he was taking a few too many drugs, but that he was not mentally ill. But nevertheless, they threw him in the local psych ward of the local hospital for a while. And then when he ran into trouble with the law, he was put in a mental health setting there as well. But once he was out of both those experiences, he was even more indignant than ever that, that there was nothing wrong with him, that this was, this was a labeling problem. He was a hippie and a, and a drug user, but he was not crazy. He was just different. And so then out of nowhere, his grandmother says, tries to get him a job. And when that fails, she says, I have a friend whose kid is at this commune down south, I'll drive you there. So she, they get in her Buick and drive to Tennessee and, and his life is changed at, at the farm, which is really, it, it's the nation's, it's America's largest commune. There are whole books about it. It's, a, it's an interesting place in its own right, but his time at the farm was transformative for him. It's just, it's just so wild to me that, that he actually agreed to have his grandmother take him there too. I think that's just <laughs> another one of the crazy small tidbits within this book that it just, it's just, they just, it's full of them. Um, so there are also a lot of tragedies in the book. Um, but to me, Mimi, who is the matriarch of the family, may be the most tragic. And you mentioned this earlier, you know, she sacrificed so much for Don, dealt with his long absences, the multiple moves, um, 12 kids. It seems to me that he took all of that for granted. He definitely um, was a man of his time, you know, where, where the domestic stuff was not going to be his thing, that he'd come home and be everybody's pal and maybe give a lecture every now and then. But really, it was Mimi's job to keep the house in order. 
and his job to have the job. And um, he was also very erudite and charismatic and scholarly. And so he, he, had, he came off as this pillar of the community, whereas at home he was in many ways a non-entity. And that, that was something that Mimi tolerated, but then became very kind of caustic and resentful about years later. And it translated into what happened when the kids got sick. She insisted on keeping the sick boys near her and helping them whenever she could. He, and, he argued that they should all go away, that they should go try to fend for themselves or go to a hospital. And she, uh, she won that argument because there was one terrible tragedy in the middle of the book, a murder-suicide involving one of the sons where she, uh, from that point forward, she wasn't going to allow uh, anyone to really have too much control over her sons. She was going to be the one managing their care. And then uh, the power balance in the family shifted significantly. And then as the years went on, she, she became more and more realist, clear-eyed and realistic and more forthcoming about the challenges of their marriage. And that, that, is, uh, uh, that happens at the same time that her, her very angry children start to see her with new eyes. Um, what, what was she like when you talked to her? Was she, she was on in years, correct? And was she mentally, um, you know, capable of, of having a conversation and, and recollections? She was mentally a hundred percent. She had a, a, she also was very, very well practiced in deflecting unpleasant conversations. She was very happy to talk to me because she understood that this would be a book about the family that talked about the genetics of mental illness. And she had been fighting the proposition that it was bad parenting that caused schizophrenia. She had spent her life fighting that notion. So she was very happy a book was happening and happy to talk with me. But it hard, was hard to get her to talk about the more difficult aspects of her life. Luckily, I had allies with me, with Margaret and, and Lindsay sitting with us, you know, the, the, the four of us there around her kitchen table. And whenever she would change the subject, the, the sisters would say, mom, and they, they'd try to pull her back in. And over time, she was able to talk about the shame she felt and how unsafe she felt at home for a long time. Um, she was able to talk about a lot of the, the issues, for sure. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier about the kids and their view of being home, um, I find it interesting that the one common element I took away among all the kids is that they hated being in their home. Yes, and, and, um, and you know, they, they were an enterprising family in their heyday. They went out on nature walks and went hiking and the boys were you know, rock climbing and rappelling and the whole family was into falconry. And so this was a great turn of events when, when mental illness took hold of so many family members, suddenly the house became a chaotic place, a place with lots of fights, a lot of danger, um, a lot of unpredictability, and then a lot of pain and anguish also. It wasn't just that, it, that, the, that the mentally ill siblings were, were running ragged, they also were suffering and crying and, and throwing up their medicine. And so, so it, it, was a, it was just a, a very sad place to be. There, were, there was one brother who, who left at the earliest age possible. There were others who went off to Denver, which is not so far away from Colorado Springs where the family was and, and kind of pretended the family didn't exist and, unless they would call every now and then. Um, holidays and family gatherings became these intense free-for-alls because suddenly everybody was in the same room together. It, it, it ebbed and flowed in a very um, unpredictable way. You know, and not to take anything, not to do any spoilers, but there's one scene of a particular Thanksgiving that is harrowing. Um, yes, and it, so it, it, once you once you read that scene, it's easy to understand why so many family members remember it. Correct. Um, you know, you were speaking about the kids, and and I expected that you know they they really took me by surprise in a lot of ways because as they go down the line, they seem to be interesting in their own ways. You know, there are musical prodigies, there's free thinkers, um, people who, kids who are drawn to the arts. Um, and it seems that the more time Donald Jr. required of Don and Mimi, these younger kids were sort of left to their own devices. Um, 
you know, Donald and Mimi seem to be somewhat hands off in certain ways in parenting the kids, but also very strict in other ways. Or, or am I reading this wrong? I think you're reading it right. It, it's very interesting how disciplined they were as a family and how, how much was required of the children at an early age. They all were altar boys. They, there was a dress code. Mimi was the type of mom who would just throw toys away. They were lying down on the floor, you know, too long, uh, uh, left alone for too long. You know, just a lot of rigidity in the household. But at the same time, this was an era of benign neglect, especially when it came to boys, um, where they, they could they they had the run of the Air Force Academy, where Dad worked for a time, and they they could just sort of do whatever they wanted and go where they wanted, and 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 it was the the sixties not the late 60s the but the pre but the new frontier 60s where where they were a part of a new optimistic generation that was going to change the world and the boys boys would be boys and go off to do what they what they did if everybody was home for supper then it was all right and i struggled with this you know trying to do a nonfiction account of the family because you you have um you have fam a family that that is very much of their time sort of letting the boys go off and do their thing but then there's so much chaos in this house as the boys are becoming sick. Why, why did they insist on continuing to do that? Why didn't they clamp down? Why didn't they own up to the difficulties? Why were they in denial for so long? And the book kind of explores that in depth. Um, you know, there's, we talked about Don's hobbies earlier, right? And one of them was falconry. And it seemed like his love of, of, of falconry was almost bordering on something like a mania or almost unhealthy in its own aspect because, you know, it, it took him away from his family, but it also they had hawks in the house. <laughs> and why, I'm just curious as to why um, that you felt like this, why, why you mentioned it in, in the degree that you did. Um, I, in the end, I found the family's, in particular Don's and, and even Mimi's interest in obsession with falconry, in the end, I found it to be relevant. Um, everybody talked about it, you know, from the very beginning. So it obviously was a big part of the family's life. But I think it also had something to do with their approach to life. I mean, this was a, a couple that, they were New Yorkers. Um, Mimi spent her early childhood in Texas, but they both really grew up and were brought up in New York City. And fortune brought them to Colorado when the Air Force moved there. And suddenly they were in this one horse town with no culture, nothing they had really imagined their lives being like. But very, very soon they, they, start, to under, they start to get to know about falconry, about hawks and falcons and domesticating falcons, which is a very arduous, very demanding process. And instead of saying, ooh, gross, and walking away from it, we're New Yorkers, they embraced it, they dove into it, and they, they geeked out on it, essentially, as a couple, and really mastered it. And I think that this says a lot about their approach to life, that they were adventurous, they were risk takers, and they, were tri they had an air of triumphalism about them because they thought, with enough discipline and hard work, you can accomplish anything. And this felt of a piece with the times, too. It was the post-war boom. However, Time goes on and the family becomes more domestic as more and more children are born. And suddenly falconry becomes Don's thing, not, just, not really Don and me, not something the couple does together, but something Don does by himself. And it has the added bonus of taking him out of the house when there are unpleasant things happening in the house. So he's able to not have to coach the kids softball, baseball teams because he's off you know, busy becoming the falconry expert for the Air Force. And so it, it takes him away from the family in the end, which is interesting to me. Um, I think, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think it's interesting that the fate and experiences of the family's two daughters who were the youngest in the family and neither of whom had the disease was quite different from the boys in the family. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and in many ways, the youngest, Mary, to me, kind of drives the story. I mean, Mary slash Lindsay drives the, drives the story. And she was the, actually the only one to get any meaningful therapy. I, I think both sisters have a lot to say to readers. I did frame it, 
the beginning and end of the book around around Mary, who changed her name to Lindsay because um, she ends up the caregiver for the brothers, and so it it winds up, you know, really tying things up in a very nice narrative way. Um, I appreciate their different approaches, but I think what what you're responding to is that they really of the everyone in the family who's well, they're the only ones who have really, really, really worked hard in a therapeutic setting, some orthodox therapies and some more cutting edge stuff to try to really address the traumas of their childhood. And so I wanted to touch on that for both of them just to see where the, those journeys take them. I wanted their, the journeys they took to get past their trauma to be a part of this story too, the same way that Michael's journey at the commune was part of the story. Um, I felt it might be instructive to readers to see what happens when, when Lindsay sees a therapist for 25 years or, or Margaret tries brain spotting, which is sort of a cutting edge therapy. Uh, how does it help them? Um, to me, there was enough room in the book to talk about schizophrenia and the brothers and to talk about this side of things as well. You know, um, there's, there are sections throughout the book that discuss the history of schizophrenia research and treatment. Now, juxtaposing these sections amidst the story of the Galvin family helped me realize what, the, you know, what a difficult illness schizophrenia is to treat. Now, do you think the Galvin family, if they wanted the same things now instead of 50 years ago, things would have turned out differently? I do think that, that if the Galvins were on the scene right now, things would be different. There would be a slightly less stigma and less, less, of, a, less of a motivation for the parents to sweep things under the rug. And therefore, the boys would have gotten more attention earlier. You know, some strange behavior at the age of 15 wouldn't be written off or overlooked or rationalized. And, and we now know that early intervention is probably one of the best hopes we have right now for treatment. That it means that whatever medication a person gets could be at a lower dosage, and that combined with uh, the right environment and therapy could actually lead to greater functionality in a person's life. And so maybe the worst of things would not have happened with so many of these boys today. Uh, that said, you know we're far away from from really understanding this illness, and we're far away from a cure. Um, the Galvins have contributed a lot to to our understanding of it, but there, there's a long way to go. I, I found that the, the, the people at the top of their field who I interviewed for this book, they all have a very healthy appreciation of that. They all understand how far there is to go. They don't say, just wait 10 minutes and we'll have this solved. Like they, they get that. And um, that was interesting to me. I also was very surprised. I had a lot of preconceived notions as a lay person I thought the drugs that treat schizophrenia were every bit as miraculous as the drugs they have now for depression or anxiety or even bipolar disorder. But really, the drugs for schizophrenia are very much the same sorts of drugs that they've been using for 50 years. And they muffle the symptoms and help make people more manageable in life. But they certainly don't roll back the clock for people. So it's, it's a standstill, pharmaceutically speaking, when it comes to schizophrenia. And that's its own issue that I try to address in the book. You know, just real quick on this too, you, you'd mentioned that and in, in some cases with a couple of the boys, those drugs were, made things worse almost. I'm getting mail, you know, an email from readers who've had that experience with other members of their family that there are some, the, the drugs that have, sometimes the drugs that are transformative for these patients, like clozapine for instance, or clozaril, it's called sometimes, it's really a last resort drug that can really help patients lead functional lives, but it also contributes to severe health problems. So once you're in your third or fourth decade of taking this drug, your system is really ground down, particularly your heart. And so there is something called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is uh, you know, defined as sort of the cure being as bad as the disease. It, it hurts you physically and wears you down and you die of a heart ailment that that ER doctors really don't recognize is related to your medication because you're probably obese at that point anyway and, and have a, a constellation of other health problems. And this happened with two of the Galvin boys. And there's a third one right now, Matthew, who's had, a, had decades of good, more or less good life with Clozaril, but now he has severe health of problems at the moment too, which they assume is medication related. My final question is, has there been any, has anything further come to light about the family or their experiences since the publication of the book? 
I've heard from a, a good handful of people who came up in school or lived on the same street as the Galvins, and they all, um, to my relief, they agree with the book's take on in the situation. They don't say, you know, this whole thing is a tissue of lies. So that's, first of all, a good thing for a nonfiction author to have happen. But they, um, they also are, um, they say things like, uh, we had always talked about it, you know, the neighbors, but we didn't know how bad it was. Or we always knew that there was something going on. And thank you for clearing up what happened there. One person went to school with Joe and confirmed us what a sweet person he was and how gentle and kind he was, which is something that everybody had said about him as well. So I'm getting a lot of affirmation in that way. And um, the researchers in the book, Robert Friedman and Lynn DeLisi, are getting a lot of attention now too, which is really great and gratifying. They were really dark horses for a very long time, studying schizophrenia when others in their field were going after the low-hanging fruit. And um, it's, it's wonderful to see them getting attention now too. Um, one other question. Um, so now this book was chosen by Oprah Winfrey as, as for her book club. How has that sort of impacted your life as, as an author? It was a, a wonderful shock to get a phone call. Um, it was just a couple uh, weeks before um, New York City shut down for the pandemic. I was wondering if Amazon would even be delivering books or whether, whether our whole global economy would shut down. Uh, um, and, and to hear that it was getting this kind of support um, was just amazing, just amazing. And um, at first I was a little puzzled because Oprah's book club tends to be about fiction, but then the more I talked about it with folks in the book club and with Oprah Winfrey herself, the more I understood that mental health is an issue that she really is very interested in. It's really one of her, one of her go-to issues that she keeps coming back to over and over again. And also this family probably would have been on Oprah's show. You know, the, the, this would have been a perfect episode for her. It really is a sort of of a piece with the sort of things that interest her. And that's a wonderful thing as well. And how uh, it's put me in a very privileged position as an author. A lot of authors are trying to break through right now and it's not easy for them. So I appreciate that as well. You know, I will say that I think also it helps that it's a really excellent uh, example of an area of nonfiction that can engage, you know, readers who, who are used to not reading nonfiction. So it's got, it's got a story amongst itself. So I think it's a really good crossover. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, once again, th uh, thank you very much for talking to us, uh, Bob. And uh, my, once again, my um, guest has been Robert Colker, author of the best-selling book, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family. The book came out in early April on Double A Books. Um, and thank you so much for everything. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. All right. Thanks.